All right. Well, uh, thanks for coming. I'm Julie Bacon. Uh, I am not, actually. So she could not make it. So uh, I'm going to fill in and just do some case study stuff uh, this morning. But so I just always tell people beforehand, um, there are some pictures that are gruesome and gory. There might be a video I can't really remember, to be honest. So if that offends you, now's the time to find a different class. Because one time uh, giving a talk, somebody told me, oh, those pictures are so gruesome. gruesome. I can't believe you showed those. And I'm like, what do you do for a living? <laughs> um, so it's what you're going to see every day at work is my assumption, right? So uh, so just FYI, uh, very quickly, our nurses, paramedics, uh, EMTs, what do, what do you all do? Nurse? Nurses? Nice. Who's the paramedic? Hey, all right. Oh, hey, two of you. All right. Thanks for coming. Uh, good. So I think we'll talk about some scene stuff. We'll talk about some inter-hospital stuff. And then <clears throat> we'll talk about a little bit of critical care stuff kind of towards the end also. I don't have any disclosures to make. Uh, no one pays me a billion dollars to be here. So I always say thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Um, I do this fairly regularly all over the country. I enjoy getting out and talking and meeting people. Uh, and then, of course, I always have to show like our transport teams stuff that looks like a circus on the outside. So uh, so there's quick objectives. We're just going to talk about <laughs> managing management of kids. I probably should have started with, my name is Dave Seastrom, by the way. Uh, I run the level one ACS verified level one center in Kansas City uh, for at Children's Mercy. Uh, and I apologize, I'm getting over strep. I'm not contagious, I promise. Uh, so yeah, that's why I sound like I've eaten a cat last night. Uh, so I always kind of just talk very quickly, touch on epidemiology and pediatric trauma. And I just remind people that pediatric trauma or in pediatrics, trauma is still the number one leading cause of death for all those kids over the age of one, right? So if you add neoplasm, congenital uh, defects, uh, uh, cancer, all of that stuff combined still does not kill as many children over the age of one as trauma does, right? So it's kind of a big thing. Uh, does anybody want to guess what the number one cause of death in traumatically injured children is as of uh, 2022? Gunshot wounds. Look at us go. Woo -woo. For the first time in about 52 years, gunshot wounds have taken over the leading cause of death in children. So look at us doing an awesome job. Uh, so it is still the same thing. And you can kind of see up here, like unintentional injury really just from ages 1 to 44, which I still fit in that woo -woo, for a couple more years. Uh, we're still most likely to have kind of um, care or traumatic injury. So I kind of put this up there just to kind of show, and I think it's a little bit different probably out here <clears throat> than it is back where I'm from is, so we're the only pediatric level one center um, for quite some, for quite a ways, right? So we sit right here on the Kansas-Missouri border. Uh, St. Louis uh, on the other side of the state is about four and a half hours away. That's where the next nearest peds level one is. The University of Iowa has a peds level one. Uh, Arkansas Children's has a peds level one. So there's a massive catchment area that we have, right? So we're probably, we are the busiest pediatric trauma center in kind of like the six state region, right? So we hump it pretty good and we enjoy it and it's it's a good time. So uh, so it just kind of ruralness kills people in Kansas and Missouri, right? So uh, so the first case study is uh, dog bite. Uh, and then there are some kind of dog bites. That's not my dog, by the way. Um, so the first was eight year old male <clears throat> attacked uh, by three dogs. And I kind of always preface this with a little bit of the backstory that mom is a night shift worker. And when I say that, I mean prostitute. Uh, but she was going to her friend Steve's house to uh, talk about astrology. And I'm literally, this is what the, the story was told to us. Um, her and Steve were going to talk about astrology at like 1 a.m. Because that's the best time to see the stars. Uh, so they put um, the eight-year-old down in the back bedroom, which wasn't really a bedroom. It was actually just the dogs. They had three Rottweilers, and that was where the dogs slept. So they just put him in one of the dogs' beds. And then somehow the dogs miraculously let themselves in the back sliding door, locked it behind them, and let themselves in their room. And they began to maul this kid, right? So uh, they didn't hear. Mom didn't really wake up to him screaming or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, she just heard the dog barking a little bit. And so they went up to investigate and then found that these three dogs had been mauling this kid, right? So she does what I, and I, and I say this wholeheartedly, I think she did what a lot of parents would do. And I think when you're the provider, it's pretty easy to separate, you know, a sick kid and us, and we're going to take care of them, and that's our job. If it's your kid, I think the story very much changes, right? I think that we become like ame amoebas, and you have no thought process whatsoever, and you just kind of go, oh, I don't know what to do. So she picked this kid up, ran into the front yard, and literally just ran around in circles screaming. So it's the kind of neighborhood that if that were to occur, you would assume someone was shooting at people, 
So someone called in a, a shooting and then, you know, you get police fire, everybody shows up, which is fantastic because this kid really needed help very quickly, right? So when they arrived, EMS, he had a heart rate of 144, weak respiratory effort. You can see his pressure is at 60 palp, his temp 33.6, his GCS is three, he's pale, weak, he's uh, weak pulses, he's kind of oozing from everywhere. And then mom really couldn't remember if he had any other medical problems, took medications or anything that would be helpful whatsoever, right? Uh, so he activated as a level one, and I should have corrected that. I apologize. So do you think this kid's sick or not so sick yet? So for the paramedics in the room, here's kind of what we see, right? So he arrives to us at 3.05 in the morning. What are you going to do for this kid? If you're, the good thing about it, I always tell people, like, my hospital is not in the hood, but we are hood adjacent. Like, we're in, like, a cool part of town, but at, like, six blocks this way, you're eh, not the best part of town. And so we're kind of hood adjacent, right? So it's a very short transport time, five to seven minutes. So what are you going to do for this kid in that very quick five to seven minutes? What's that? Yeah, I agree. Stop the hemorrhage if you can. <laughs> I always tell people, a lot of people would say, oh, I think we should intubate. Mm, I don't think that's really the right call, right? I think a BLS maneuvers for this kid almost the whole way are great, right? Don't spend time on scene. Don't waste time trying to do a whole lot of stuff. Get him in the back, get some lines in this kid, BV in this kid or bag this kid if he needs it, and let's move, right? So <clears throat> we used to stay and play 20 years ago when I worked ground EMS um, and when I flew a little bit. Uh, and that's just really not the case anymore, right? So they did a really good job getting this kid over, uh, up and moving quickly. So he arrives at 3.05, his airway is patent, patent his trachea is midline. He has a weak respiratory effort. He's pale. He has one plus central pulses. He's pale and cold, not too sh un shockingly. Um, he's unres unresponsive. He has a GCS of three. His pupils are uh, not documented. So again, we don't really know. So that's all right. Cap refill is uh, at four seconds, right? So this is kind of what it, what it looks like for us. So you can kind of see his uh, vital signs. So his pressures are 70s over 40s. The heart rate's 131. Um, he's being bagged at this rate. So he gets intubated, obviously. <clears throat> and you can kind of see his vent settings. He gets two IOs placed, one on the right, one on the left leg. And I put on here, his uh, first liter of saline went up, um, and I put warm with a question mark for a reason, right? So we initially put all of his fluids on a warmer, and then uh, one of the ER docs said, this kid's too sick, we don't have time to fool around with that. So take it off the warmer. What do you think the right answer to that is? <laughs> it is not to take it off the warmer, right? I always remind them those little things sometimes like this really do help. And then this just triggers the fact that then when we start blood, we're not going to warm the blood, right? Because we don't have time to warm the blood. So I always jokingly tell people I am um, a very transparent person. Like if we make mistakes and here's the real estate, we all make mistakes, right? I don't know where you guys work or what you do, but like at shock trauma, I visited there at Johns Hopkins at us at chop. There are mistakes that are made at all of these hospitals, right? And our goal is to take these kind of things and learn from them and do a, jo a better job next time, right? If any of you have worked someplace that have never made mistakes, please let me know because I'm going to apply for a job there. Uh, but I assume that's probably not the case, right? So the air doc, thought, so they took him off the warmer. You can kind of see this kid starts getting blood products pretty quickly. Uh, and this was a few years ago, right? We would never probably put a second liter of fluid saline up on this kid, right? Is there a massive amounts of research that show blood products are so far superior peds? The answer is not really. There, there's not overwhelming um, evidence in the literature that shows that, right? But we think it probably does a little bit better. And there's some that support it, I 100% agree, but it's not overwhelmingly supportive yet. <clears throat> so uh, we did talk about uh, the warming of fluids, right? That ER physician and I disagree on what is important in resuscitations, and 40% of pediatric trauma patients come in hypothermic, so that warming of product is a pretty uh, important piece, right? I asked her, I said, do you think in the NICU they worry about those little details on those little sick kids? And she goes, well, absolutely. I said, I'm confused of what the difference is then, right? And there was, so yeah, we have agreed to disagree in that she is wrong and I am correct. In my head anyway. No, the, actually, we had, it was a really good discussion, right? So whether you use the level one or you use a Belmont or the Life Flow or whatever you want to use, it doesn't matter to me, but any of those mass transfusion kind of uh, rapid infuser systems are fantastic, right? So we go to CT very quickly. <clears throat> he gets a left subclavian line placed, which is typically not a line that we use in a lot of kids. We use a lot more groin lines we're at. Um, I don't know, we just, we just do. Um, and you can kind of see his labs, obviously. So his ABG is not fantastic. His CPK is around 6,700, 7,000. What do you think about his coags? How's that look? Yeah, so we're, I have a resuscitation lecture later today. 
Uh, so I'm not gonna harp to death on like coagulation or coagulopathies and acidosis and hypothermia and how that kills trauma patients, whether you're eight years old or 80 years old, because it's just a fact it does. Uh, but <laughs> those are not really great, right? And he's fairly hypothermic. So each of those makes the other one worse and worse, right? So <clears throat> we just kind of got to keep in mind those kind of things. And I think the theory was before is that, you know, our resuscitative efforts really added to those coagulopathies. And, and what we've known is that that's really not true, right? As soon as you're injured and have a uh, hemorrhage or a significant hemorrhage or blood loss, those coagulopathies start right away. It's not something that we're just causing and affecting to patients, right? It occurs as a disease process, which is great for us to know a little bit more. So uh, when they hit the PICU, and I always, are any, is anybody a PICU, like ex-PICU nurse or ex-ICU nurse? We know they're real anal retentive in the ICU, right? And like, oh, don't touch my line. I've got it laid exactly where I want it, which is just not me, right? Uh, and so, I, but I will always give them credit. Like they started warming the fluids, warming the blood products, warming everything that goes in this kid, bear hugger, all of that stuff's appropriate, right? And this was actually probably one of the patients that started a big PI project in our house, um, just about keeping patients warm and warming fluids and blood products and stuff, which is great. So this would, I can tell you, would n absolutely never happen today, right? So it's good that we've recognized these things and make progress because that's really what it's all about. Uh, so his belly starts to become a little bit firm at this point, but I wanted to give you just some pictures and so you can kind of see what the wounds looked like, right? <laughs> so after the fact, um, when he actually woke up and was able to talk to us, um, he told us that when the dog started attacking him, he just kind of curled up in the fetal position because um, he thought he was scared that they were going to bite him in the face. And that's what really scared him. And I, you know, and not that we were telling him this, but like the other providers is that's probably what saved this kid's life, right? He didn't have anything in the trunk. Like they didn't get him in the neck. They did get him once, like in the shoulder area, but he didn't have any bites to the neck. He had very few to the face because he was really tucked in and they just got a lot of his extremities, right? So I guess my question is, in a very short period of time frame, from the dogs starting to attack him to the time EMS arrived, because we know typically in an urban environment, it's five to seven minutes is a nice average EMS response time, right? Why is this kid so sick so quickly? Why did he go from a normal, healthy eight-year-old to unresponsive with the GCF3, hypother or, you know, hypotensive, tachycardic, hypothermic, all of that stuff? His CT was clear. He didn't have anything in the belly. There's no massive blood loss, no hemoperitoneum in the belly that, we're, that we see. The one lab I always kind of remind people is his CPK was like 7,000, right? So if you look at this picture and ignore all the wounds, what do you see? What's all of this? Just a bunch of bruising, right? Like it's almost like a crush patient, right? With all of that soft tissue damage, that's just going to throw everything awry, right? So there's several things. One, this kid didn't have a whole lot of hemorrhage. I, I, you were spot on with controlling hemorrhage earlier. Yeah, I 100% agree. He was just oozing kind of from everywhere. So add that coagulopathy in there with all these just kind of open, superficially kind of wounds, and you just get this big ooze effect, right? So that's part of it too. But the other thing is just kind of looking beyond that stuff. And you can kind of see like the outline of the dog's mouth and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So here's what his CT showed, right? So he's got a left clavicle fracture, obviously, a lot of areas of abnormal gas accumulation, a left pleural effusion, a little, uh, little retroperitoneal fluid, whether it's from his pancreas or his kidney at this point, no one's going to take this kid to the operating room. There's absolutely no reason to. One, if it's a pancreas, there's nothing we're going to do. Two, if it's a kidney, they're 97% non-operative. We're not going to go in for his kidney either, right? So we're going to leave both of those things. He's got a little shock bowel, and he's got a scrotal injury. One of, the, um, one of his testicles was actually torn off uh, and removed by the, by the dogs. So here's this quick little chest x-ray, right? So not to get too much into the weeds with it, but you can kind of see his clavicle fracture. He's got a lot of subcutaneous air or gas out here. And then what's this big thing? Right, it's just his stomach, right? What's that probably from? Very simple, crying BVM, right? So I always tell like our EMS providers or the folks who arrive to these kids really soon, because we met with the EMS crew, they were a little shaken by this case. Um, and, you know, I kind of told them, I said, the only thing, I, I think you guys did everything correctly. I really do. I, I truly do. And if I didn't, I would tell them. I said, the only thing I could tell you that maybe you would think about next time is using an oral airway. He goes, well, we were kind of having trouble bagging the kid and, you know, his little airway and stuff. And there was a lot of things going on. I said, absolutely. I said, just think about those 10 cent items in the, in the bag that make the world of difference. I said, if you just slid that in there, 
you wouldn't have to worry about that kid's tongue falling back on his posterior pharynx. It probably made it a little bit easier for you. So other than that, I think they did a really great job, right? So it's a pretty benign uh, chest x-ray so far. So this kiddo had some interesting stuff. So he had air. If you haven't seen a lot of CT scans, white is bone, gray is tissue, uh, black is air, right? So this kid, uh, you normally do not have air in the base of your skull, which he did. Uh, he also had what I've never seen. I've been a nurse for 22 years now, um, and I've never seen this, but he has air in his spinal column itself. Um, does anybody know what that's called? What's that? <laughs> you get a prize. It's at the bar at about seven o'clock tonight. Okay, uh, my flight's at six thirty, so I won't be there. But I, you'll do a good. You'll you'll be fine. I faith. Uh, I, literally, I'm not joking. Uh, Twenty two years I've been doing this. I have never seen this in my life. I didn't even know what it's called. It's called pneumo reiki. I had to look it up, <laughs> and I was like, man, am I just a bad nurse? Like I don't know what this is called. But does anybody actually know what that was called before I said it? Okay, I, I feel less stupid now. Ooh. You know, sometimes you're like, you don't know what you don't know kind of thing. Yeah. So that was a pretty impressive, right? He's got a bunch of air in the soft tissues, obviously, <clears throat> which is, is not shocking. He hasn't dropped a lung that we can see, right? So when he gets into the ICU, um, his hospital day, uh, number two, we started a little bit of Lasix on him because he was a little overloaded. As you can see, he's four, positive 1,400. And I always tell people, like, <clears throat> it's really easy when you work in the ground EMS or, or the transport team or the ED because you see these patients for typically a very short period of time. And we want to resuscitate them. And this kid had crappy pressures. He was hypotensive. He was tachycardic. He was hypothermic. He had craglopathic. He had all of these things going on, right? Can you just stop giving him fluid because you're going to overload him later on? Not really, right? I mean, you could try some epi or norepi. But realistically, this kid probably just needed fluid instead of clamping down the vasculature a little bit more, right? So it's just one of those things. You know, everything that we do for patients, there's a, a cause and effect, right? Um, I, I jokingly heard somebody give a lecture the other day on, I don't know why I'm laughing. Uh, it was on, he was talking about MIs and he said, everything we do in healthcare, there's a good, and that's what we wanna do. And then there's always like a side effect. And he goes, if you listen to the, the, uh, the ad for Viagra, one of the side, side effects is death and, and heart attack. I was like, okay, so that's a good pill for that. But boy, it's really kind of offsets with the bad things, right? It's the same kind of thing. This kid need to resuscitate a fluid. Now we just have to deal with it a little bit after the fact on the second day, right? And you can see his ABGs have gotten a lot better. Uh, his eyes and nose were gotten a lot better. He got extubated on hospital day three, which did pretty good. If you guys have extubated kids or worked around kids who got extubated, any, you'll know that having a little upper airway strider, which doesn't sound like this, by the way, is not horribly uncommon, right? Um, a lot of times when we estubate kids, they get a little, uh, a little striderous up top, uh, a, a breathing treatment, and they typically do a whole lot better, and they do just fine. This kid d did not <laughs> get a whole lot better. Um, he ended up with some non-invasive ventilation. Uh, he had a little uh, stenosis of his le left main stem uh, bronchus, which um, no one uh, no one knew. It was an un uh, a new finding for this kid. It, he had weirdly enough, he had never been intubated at eight years old. So it was kind of a new thing that we uh, kind of found when we extubated him. And but he actually continued to do really well uh, and progressed fine without that. Right. So hospital day six. <clears throat> He uh, is awake interacting with staff. And I always say, not the mom. And I, I, if you don't work with peds very often, I always kind of emphasize how much the parents are, are useful to us, right? Um, in good ways and in bad ways, right? So when he was in the ICU, we kind of kept him in the ICU after he was in, extubated for a couple of days. It just seemed very appropriate at the time. And we weren't, it, we weren't, you know, packed at the gills. We had, if we needed to move him, we could, but we didn't need to. So we just kind of left him there for a little bit. Um, and it was kind of interesting. I happened to be up there in the room once and when his, he was playing on the iPad and kind of awake and just, I mean, super sweet, just cute as can be little eight year old. And when his mom came around the corner and he saw her, he just would drop the iPad and his head went down and like no interaction. Like he just, his whole affect just vroom, like you turn off a light switch. I mean, it was just, and I just stood there. I was like, what in the hell? Like that is, it's the most profound thing I've seen uh, uh, fairly recently, because usually mom and dad and grandma and grandpa, that's comfort, that's home. They immediately go to them, right? And this kid just did not. And she would come in and hug him and he would just literally just kind of like, just kind of sit there. And I thought, oh God, how sad is that? You know? Um, so obviously DFS was involved. It was reported as, you know, you probably shouldn't take your kid to work if you're a prostitute kind of thing. And they agreed, which is great. Um, he did have a, a slight increased work of breathing, which is he had a, a left hemidiaphragm um, that was paralyzed, we found on ultrasound. 
So probably didn't help his, you know, striders after he was extubated, plus his little work of breathing for a couple of days, right? We'll rehab him. He'll be fine with that. He won't have any really long-lasting effects. But um, hospital day 11, he's feeling much better, increased activity. He was transferred to the floor, um, and he was discharged on hospital, hospital day 24 to foster care um, and continues to do well. And I say continues to do well because we still see this kid versus just some chronic issues. Uh, but I am proud to say and happy to say, and I don't know if this is really something to be happy about, but mom and uh, the state uh, uh, terminated mom's parental rights and he has a new foster family. And he just, I mean, every time he comes to clinic, he's just running in the door like, <laughs> so he's so much happier, just a really good kid. Um, and the foster family are just great to him. So I, I always say it's not really a good thing that you terminate somebody's parental rights, but if you're not taking care of the kid, then I don't feel so bad about it, right? Uh, so I think this kid's probably gonna do just fine. So pretty easy one so far, right? They get better if we go, as we go. Well, maybe not better, but this one's a little bit easier too. So uh, 911 call. It's a go-kart crash. Uh, it did not look like a Mario go-kart, but that's the best I could do, right? <coughs> uh, so they get the call at 15, 16. They're on scene at 24. Uh, at the patient at 25, they depart the scene at 29. And I always, again, I worked ground EMS in a busy 911 system. So I always try to give um, props to EMS when they do a really good job. Um, unless you've actually worked a 911 EMS system, you have no idea what it's like. <laughs> it is uh, sometimes the best job in the world and sometimes it is just dog shit, right? It just is sometimes is horrible. So uh, I always give props when I think people do a really great job and I think they did. You know, departing a four minute scene time is extremely hard to do. Because usually you have to park like behind the 18 fire trucks and the seven cop cars, which means you have to walk a half mile to get there. And in four minutes, that's a lot for me, right? So um, props that they were on and off the scene very quickly. Uh, and then they arrived at their destination at 44. So they had about, just about six and a half miles to go. So what they get there, when they, when they get there, here's what they find. A 14-year-old <clears throat> female lying supine. Uh, she's 10 feet from the go-kart that she had crashed. Uh, she has a non-rebreather on at 15. She's a little sleepy and groggy, but her GCS is uh, relatively 15, actually. Uh, she's tender in all her quadrants. That's probably because uh, she has an evisceration noted to the left side. So I have just always told people, like, if you see the bowel hanging out, you don't need to push. It's probably tender. You can assume that that's tender. Like, if my knee, if my leg has two knees and it bends twice, you can assume it's tender. I don't need you to go, that hurt? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where that bone comes through the skin, that hurts. You don't, you don't need to push on it. We, we get that, right? Let's just, we, we all assume those very basic care things, right? Yeah. Uh, his left upper extremity has an open fracture <clears throat> and his right lower or her right lower extremity has an open fracture also. So she's just killing it this morning, right? So she is alert. <clears throat> uh, she has one plus distal pulses. Her revised trauma score is 11. Her abdomen's tender and all the <laughs> shocking quadrants. And you can kind of see her vital signs, right? So her blood pressure is 82 palp. Her heart rate's 102. I will say this. If, if, my, if I look down and see like my colon like pop it out my heart rate will be double that guaranteed like i'm like nah! you know that's a bad thing uh respiratory rate 16 her sats were a little bit they were uh, do you think 82 percent on non-rebreathers probably concerning a little bit maybe yeah maybe just a little bit right it's okay uh, we did get a kid that brought in uh just last week it was on a non-rebreather at six liters a minute and i was like ah well, that's good eh, we're gonna talk about that later uh, and her pain was 10 out of 10. Again, if you can see the bowels outside of the abdomen, I think you can just assume the pain is 10, but you should probably ask her to use that faces thing. Uh, but yeah, so they put a C collar on her, good or bad? Yes, probably not bad, okay. Would you put her on a, on a spine board, like mobilize her on a board? I love asking, no, I love asking that question because wherever you are in the United States, the answers differ very widely. There are some places that still live and die by the backboard. Like everybody goes on a backboard, cross stitch, you can stand them up, turn them upside down, and they're not moving. Uh, back home, we don't use backboards at all um, because there's no evidence to ever support them. I mean, basically, that's why we do it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think collar is great. I think backboards are great for a couple things. One, moving patients, and two, strapping in the arms of dead people as you code them, and then putting the oxygen bottle in the monitor between their legs. That's really what they're good for. Other than that, they have does not immobilize the spine. When's the last time you saw somebody's spine that's that flat? Right? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, off my soapbox about how much I hate spine boards, and we should turn them into coffee tables and back to the actual presentation. Yeah, okay. Uh, so she has a non-rebreather in place. Uh, she has a 20 gauge in her left AC. <clears throat> she has 200 of uh, fluid given so far. Obviously, they take her right away. Off she goes. Um, and they just kind of throw some four by fours on her wounds, which I think is fine, right? Again, better basics uh, translates into a good care for kids. Uh, I, I will say... Um, 
in, in my EMS career, especially when I flew, I, I don't, I think I was like the evisceration guy. Like I had taken four or five patients that had eviscerations and their bowels were hanging out. And an old, old, old flight nurse, uh, top, he was like my orienter, orienter, orientator. I don't know, preceptor, that's a better word. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, he kind of taught me like this very easy, like if you want to make a, a Bugatti bag like on the go, just take a saline bag, cut three sides, open it up, the inside sterile because the fluid was in there, throw some wet four by fours on there and then just tape the bag down. And it kind of gives you, the, you know, it, it's, it works. It works in dirty EMS pre-hospital environments, right? And it's super, super simple. You don't need to stitch it in, just literally tape it. But those things work. And I put those pictures in there because that's an actual OR suite where they did use 0.9% uh, sodium chloride, the bag, and then just they sutured it to the patient. Yeah. So you can tape it in the pre hospital world. We'll get away with that just fine, right? Works great. It's a great temporizing measure. So is this kiddo sick or not sick? Probably sick, right? Again, pretty easy. Bowels hanging out. Yeah, we're going to do it. I think EMS did just fine, right? And then the transport decision, they go the wrong place or the right place. Um, we sometimes still get folks who transport our kids who are sick like this to adult trauma centers who then say, no, 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 and then they transfer them to us, right? Um, which is fine. I, I'm happy that they do, and we're happy. Our doors are always open. We had less than five hours of diversion in all of 2022. Like, we just don't close the doors. We're the only Pete's hospital around for four and a half hours. Like, there's nobody else, right? Uh, University of Kansas will take some of some kids. Uh, they have a PICU that's like four beds. But if it's somebody that's like an ECMO kid that's real sick, they don't, you know, they're going to ship them to us. So uh, I'm happy that they do, but we just are still working with EMS to get those kids directly to us, unless they really need to stop for airway management or the patient's crumping, right? Uh, so when they EMS reassesses, the pressures are 65 over 33, the heart rate's 121, uh, her stats are now 99%, uh, pain's still uh, 10, GCS still 14. Yeah, all of that stuff kind of continues, right? So I always put up there like PEDS resources. Um, unless you really work on a PEDS team, um, like these folks over here could probably tell you every vital sign you want to know for a seven-year-old. And kudos, because I have so much crap up here that's not useful knowledge, but I want to retain it because if I ever go to a trivia game, I got things in here that might be on a trivia test that I need to remember, right? Um, or a pawn shop. You, oh, man. I know. It's true. My best friend works at a pawn shop. I know. And I love it because he's non-medical. Oh, God. Yeah. But if you need a free TV or a, like a reduced price TV, let me know. I'll hook you up with them. Um, so these things are great. Whether you use the Braslow or hand TV, I don't care. I have no stake in either one of these. Um, they're both horrendously expensive. So, you know, you pick whatever. Uh, but they both work. And I think that's really important. Um, I always, uh, I do have to like sell a little bit and say the PEDS Guide app is our app at Children's that we use uh, or that we've developed and we use. And it has a resuscitation module, asthma, febrile infant, um, uh, brewery, and antibiotics, and a couple others. So if you go into the resuscitation app, it's free, by the way. It's free. So if you just search PEDS Guide, it's free. Uh, in the resuscitation app, you can put in the patient's weight or their age, um, and it will give you the color on the Braslo. It'll give you all of their drug dosages. Uh, it'll figure the burn uh, resuscitation formula for you. And I always tell people these kind of things, whether it's ours or somebody else's, all of those things are super duper happy or, or super duper handy, right? Um, you can be the best, most knowledgeable flight nurse in the entire world. If you don't have a PEDS reference card in your pocket, you're doing something wrong. I'm sorry, you just are, right? When you think about higher levels of functioning or whatever, do, do you want to rely on making that 0.01 or 0.1 decision in the middle of a PED crashing and it's just you and your partner at 2,500 feet? That's probably the worst time to try to use massive amounts of cognitive ability, right? So use these things that are super easy. Use these things that are backed by, you know, people that have done PEDS and stuff. And I think they're just super easy. So I, I think they're handy. You don't have to use ours, but use somebody's. There's a bunch out there. I will also just caution you. There are a couple that you can download um, from the Apple Store that were made up by, like, John L. Smith. No credentials. <laughs> so... Um, some just know what you're downloading before you start using it, because there are a couple critical care apps out there that I promise you are far from critical care apps. Um, so, you know, whatever. But anyway, Peds Guide is ours. It's free. If you want it, please feel free to download it. Uh, and then they will probably be like, well, they had a lot of downloads. Yeah, it's the Baltimore folk. I'm telling you. Uh, so when they arrive to us, here's what we see. Blah, blah, blah. You can all kind of read that. I'm not going to read it to you, but she's still a little hypotensive. She's pretty tachycardic. She's almost hypothermic, shockingly, again, right? This, it's in every kid. Her belly's distended, obviously. She's had evisceration. So those are kind of our massive 
things that we're thinking of right now, right? So <clears throat> we send her labs. She's still hypotensive. That's kind of becoming a problem. So it's decided it's time to take a little bit more control. So we put her down with automatate rock, intubate her, and start some blood products, a little bit of saline uh, blood products. She gets a uh, femoral uh, central line placed. And we're kind of making progress, right? And I think that's as good. We need to make progress fairly quickly. So a little bit of fentanyl, obviously. I always tell people if, if I appear to have a, uh, between here and uh, the airport, if that bus rolls over and I can see bones or my gut sticking out, I want enough fentanyl. Like here's my theory on pain control. Just push till quiet. When I stop screaming, you have delivered the appropriate dose, right? Okay, I, have to, I also have to mention, I say that jokingly. If anybody didn't understand that, here or online, that's a joke. I had one guy come up to me after talking and go, so like with kids, you just keep pushing when they stop like making a lot of noise, that's when you, that's, that's the dose you give? And I said, oh, God, no, I assumed everyone knew that was a joke since everyone laughed. And he's like, oh, I was just making sure. Do you have a card? Can I see your business card? <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was a joke. Ha. Um, so here's kind of the trauma, bay, right? So chest and pelvis, obviously blunt trauma. We're going to look at those things really, those films really quickly. Uh, this was back in the days of COVID. So obviously you've got to wrap a COVID test, uh, start pack reds, uh, pack cells three or FFP number one, and then off we go to the OR, right? So we started massive transfusion as soon as things were just not progressing the way that we thought they had should. <clears throat> so massive transfusion, we started and off to the OR that we go. So here's kind of what we found, right? So the dough to the OR is 53 minutes. I think that's okay. Or I think our on paper goal is 60 minutes or less. In my head goal, it's 30 minutes or less, but I, I will agree with 60, that's pretty okay. Uh, and here's what we kind of found. She had a duodenal trans transection at the ligament of trites, some vascular injury at the level a lot. She had a perforated stomach at the greater curvature, grade three liver lack, bilateral renal injuries, was from retroperitoneal blood, a pancreatic tail, complete transection. She had a sub C2, C3 subluxation, uh, ligamentous injury, left posterior olecranon fracture, right hip dislocation and fracture, and obviously an acute renal injury because she became aneuric, right? So she's got a lot of injuries, right? If, and if I always say, if you don't take care of kids often, this is what I mean. Like she didn't look great in the very, no, that's a lot of slides back. Like she didn't look great here, but did anybody think she had that many things wrong with her? Right. Kids are really great at compensating, kind of hiding those injuries, right? So those are all the things that we've kind of found with her. So off to the operating room we go. This is kind of what we see. Her uh, intraoperatively, she got 2,100 of PAC cells, 462 of platelets, 663 of uh, plasma, um, 1,200 of plasma light. I don't know if everybody uses plasma light. We do. Our anesthesia folks love plasma light. I don't know why, but they do. Um, and then some 5% albumin. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ouch. And her uh, estimated blood loss was about 1,700. So here's kind of her totals, right? So her ED total was about 2,900. Her OR total was about 5,400. So it puts her at about 8,400 roughly mLs of product, fluids, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, we, you know, we kind of sometimes, we usually figure um, a kid's blood at somewhere between 60, 70, and 80 per kilo, kind of their whole circulating volume. So for her, that's her circulating blood volume. Total, all the blood in her body. If you squeeze her like a turnip, that's what you'd get out, right? And this is what we transfused her. So you know, just very simply, what do we know about transfusing someone two times their blood volume? That the mortality rate just, meow, like you're soaring high, right? It just gets much worse. Everything gets worse with that. But it is what we, it is, what it is, and this is what we do, right? And she actually did pretty well. So she returned on post-op day one with trauma and orthopedic surgery. <clears throat> they closed her, uh, closed reduction of her right hip. And this is the other thing, you know, along 15 years ago, we were still guilty of this. We would take, we would have taken her to the operating room We'd have fixed her bowels, ortho would have came in, done all of this stuff on all of her open fractures, and she'd have been in the OR for eight or nine or 10 hours, right? But we'd have fixed everything. And she came out with a pH in the high sixes, <laughs> cold as can be, acidotic. And we've kind of learned, obviously, over the years that that's just not the right thing to do, right? So this whole damage control theory, bless you, this whole damage control theory of going in, stopping hemorrhage, fixing the absolute necessity type things, and then getting out of the operating room, warm them up, correct their coagulopathy, their acidosis, all of that stuff is in the patient's vastly best better interest right so we're only going to go in fix the absolute necessities things that we need to and then we're going to get out of the or because that just doesn't help right and every or is 50 degrees below zero so <clears throat> they did re-explore her abdomen uh they did some fluorescent angiography on her bow which kind of unfortunately showed a, a bunch of global ischemia on just her bow uh so they left her open in a modified silo because the thoughts were 
we're probably gonna have to go back at some point and remove some bowel, right? Like she's shunted everything so much to the core vital organs during this nasty perfusion or massive resuscitation that she probably has some shock bowel. She's gonna lose some bowel, almost guaranteed, right? So uh, she was placed on CRRT for anuria. Uh, she did go back to the OR the very um, post-op day three and they took out 170 centimeters of bowel out, right? Which down the road will obviously cause more issues and problems. Uh, but for now, this is kind of what we needed to do. And they did a distal pancreatectomy, obviously, because she had a pancre pancreatic tail dissection, a complete dissection. So <clears throat> we were able to take a lot out of her on the CRRT, but she still got a little bit of transfusions here and there, right? Anything else you could think about with her resuscitation that kitchen sink, anything else you, you think would have been beneficial for that? She wasn't as coagulopathic as I thought she would be. It's just a long battle sometimes, right? So she does well, actually. She's, uh, I think, I don't, I'm not sure if she's still in house with us, but she continue, is continuing to do fairly well, right? Uh, she'll obviously have some, I mean, this is a life changing injury. She has short gut stuff, I mean, from now on, and diet and all of that kind of stuff will be uh, vastly different. But again, she's leaving the hospital cognitively intact, which is, I always think, a, a little bit of a win, you know? Um, and she, did, she didn't have any, uh, she had that ligamentous tear at two, C2 and C3, but she didn't have any paralysis from it, which I think is really great too. Okay, so case number two or three, I mean, however you look at it, you know, you start your Tuesday however you want. So motor vehicle crash, right? So real simple, the pre hospital stuff, very quickly at the patient, departed the scene three minutes, which is fantastic, nine and a half miles to go. She's an eight-year-old, uh, motor vehicle crash, she's confused and combative when they get there, eight-year-old male, I'm sorry, uh, for motor vehicle crash, confused and combative. When they get there, he's complaining of severe shortness of breath and chest pain. <coughs> I apologize. <clears throat> okay, let's try that again. <clears throat> uh, so a rollover crash, uh, and I always, I, I do for the paramedics, I, I mean, everybody else probably gets this too, but I always just keep picking on you guys. When you guys describe things like this, it is so very important, right? And nothing uh, just makes me want to throw something harder that when you used to we would roll in the doors with a fresh trauma or, or a fresh in mind they're like you only got one IV I'm like oh do you want to you want to hold this upside your head real quick yeah I got one ID because I was bagging them by myself and strolling lines and giving all the meds because nobody else could do it so I'm by myself yes I've only got one IV are you gonna make it nursey uh <laughs> so uh, I know like I just I still carry that right like I haven't been in like EMS for I still carry that anger uh so I mean, I don't, I'm not, I don't like kick my dog when I go home, but sometimes I'm like, eh, you never know. Um, so things like this, I think are super important. This is what they charted, quote, the rollover crash, total destruction, and the engine was missing from the vehicle. Like they got there and there's a car with no engine. Like where did it, I mean, those things are, that's bolted to the frame of the vehicle. Like those things are just like, oh, I took it out and put it over there, you know? That to me, without knowing anything else about the crash, tells you there's something very wrong with this patient. Like. This is massive amounts of kinetic energy that have just been dispersed, right? The roll cage, obviously, I mean, if the car had total destruction, the engine was missing, the roll cage did not protect the participants, right? Because they were going 70 miles an hour and went head on with the semi truck. Just massive amounts of energy, right? Even this belted, you're lucky to survive these kind of injuries, right? Or these kind of crashes. So knowing nothing else, I'm already in my head going, oh, this one's gonna be sick, like real sick, right? We got it. We're, gonna, we're gonna move on this one. And then she had some foamy blood from her mouth. Um, along with her chest pain and shortness of breath. Pretty pretty unusual in an eight-year-old, right? So when they get there, she has a GCS of 10. She's kind of got this upper, right upper gaze a little bit, and then she's combative and kind of screaming. And I always kind of tell people like, it's great to know what that, that GCS is. And, and realistically, people are like, well, is that like 11 or 12? I'll be, I don't care. Is it 15, is it eight, is it three? That's what I really want to know. Like, am I going to need to intubate her, or be ready for an intubation, or is she like the GCS of a tree in three, right? So uh, I'm not arguing over, oh, I think that's a 13, not a 12. I don't really care. If it's 15, it's eight or it's three. That's what I really need to know, right? So I tell, and I think that helps us kind of get an idea because this is going to change, right? Whether she just concussed or she actually has a brain injury, the next 15 minutes will be like, oh, she's unresponsive. Now she's asking what happened 75,000 times. Oh, now she's unresponsive. Oh, now she's screaming at me. That's just what it looks like, right? That's the normal thing. So you can see her vital signs. Her, um, she has a one, uh, her blood pressure is 136 palp. Heart rate's 136, her respiratory rate's 28, her blood sugar reads as high. She has bruising to the right chest with gurgling sounds in the upper. Noted, her belly is soft and she's moving and sensing all of her extremities, right? 
You think she's real sick? I agree. Yeah. With that and this kind of stuff is just very uncommon in kids, right? And I would tell most people, you, you just don't see children with torn aortas very often at all. I mean, I've been at Children's for, I don't know, 25,000 pediatric trauma patients, and I think we've had three. And two of the three were from gunshot wounds. I mean, it just doesn't happen in blunt trauma in children. If you do, those are the kids that you'll find dead on the scene that just don't survive, right? Um, so I think this is concerning because typically kids don't have a lot of big chest injuries, right? Uh, so they put a non-rebreather on her, uh, did an EKG. She just kind of requiring that continuous oral suctioning and they immediately transport her. And I always jokingly say like, if they transport with a firefighter, like they've asked for help, like it's, you should be aware. Like that's something, you know, very rarely we do be like, oh, can you come with us? Like we really need your help. But when they're sick, you're like, can you come with us? We really need your help. And I think that's good, right? So these very subtle, simple things, um, I'm not gonna care, let's skip that one. Uh, there was no other vital signs or documentation um, after that, which just tells me that they were really busy, right? It is what it is. When they arrived to us, uh, her airway is open and intact, uh, coarse lung sounds bilaterally, uh, pink and a little warm, cap refill is probably around two seconds. She had, he still had two plus distal pulses, which, uh, uh huh. Um, his blood pressure is 98 over 46. You can see the heart rate. The respiratory rate's at 48, and the SATs are 87% on a non rebreather with a rate of 48. And this one is not hypothermic yet, which is amazing. Yay. Um, and you can kind of see head, uh, they didn't have one. So the neck was supple and the trachea was midline. Um, the chest had a lot of abrasions and tenderness. You know, I have literally looked at this lecture a billion times and have never noticed that. So that's, I'm glad I could share that with. You all from Baltimore uh, and Florida, Florida. Uh, so the chest is um, <laughs> as abrasions and tenderness. That's so disappointing. I'm just stuck on that right now. Uh, yeah. Whatever, put that in the evaluation. His slides wouldn't even complete, jeez. Uh, the pelvis is stable, uh, is incontinent of stool. And we all know if, if someone poops themselves, that that's bad, right? That's a sign. <clears throat> so you can kind of see her ED arrival <clears throat> at 1833. Um, obviously, 20 gauge, her fast was negative. Does it, do you guys do, I don't know where you guys work, but does anybody do fasts routinely on kiddos? You, you guys? We will have fellows sometimes, they're like, oh, I just love the fast machine. I'm like, okay, well, I mean, whatever, float your boat. Can you bill for it? Whatever. Uh, so we don't routinely do fast on kids, because one, uh, if you look at the literature, it's very inconsistent whether it's actually beneficial in peds. They have such smaller spaces to identify hemorrhage. Uh, it doesn't really, even if they do have a positive fast, they're still not automatically going to the operating room. So I don't, I, I, it's a piece of the puzzle, right? And when I talk to just some of the folks back home, our, our, our outreach and our, our kind of our rural patients, they're like, yeah, but his, his heart rate was 130. And I'm like, yeah, but look at the whole patient picture, right? Was his, pale, was his skin pale, cool, and diaphoretic? Was he shocky? Was he hypotensive? What was his heart rate? What was his respiratory rate? Like, look at the whole patient picture. And I always tell them it's kind of like a puzzle, right? Like, you want to get every piece of the puzzle in place just because they have one thing that's off from, but everything else looks fine, I don't know that that would, I wouldn't throw the red flags up. So if everything else was normal and they had a positive fast, I, I wouldn't put a lot of weight behind that. I mean, we're not running to the operating room, right? We, I would assume like, I think Hopkins is a PEDS level one center, right? I'm sure we're very similar. Uh, we are 95% non-operative on our appropriately selected cases, which means no gunshot wounds are obviously going to the OR still, but on blunt, trauma kids, we're, we're 95% of those kids are not ever going to the operating room, right? So we're, we use it here and there. It's just not a mainstay of what we do, right? So we did intubate them, got a right femoral line, ABG, uh, chest x-ray fully, returned some red urine. So obviously that's not probably horribly shocking to us. Went to CT scan and apparently they had a brunch in there because they were there forever uh, and then came back to the bay. And again, you know, I always tell people like, you know, our, our process improvement is to find areas that we can improve upon. Uh, 1830, and we're back in the resuscitation room at 2012. Daddy's not happy, right? That's just, yeah, that, my, when we leave the bay and go to CT, there better be a room someplace else because we are not coming back to where we should have been. And these things probably should have been done beforehand, right? So <clears throat> left sub, we placed a left subclavian line, packed cells, a left chest tube was placed, and then we off, went off to the PICU. So two hours and 38 minutes in the ED with a critically injured patient is way too long, right? There's just no excuse. Uh, I mean, there was an excuse. Like, if you've got the kid's chest open, okay, I'll give you that. Fine. But still, we should go to the operating room eventually, right? 
So this is a long time. So we still have process to work on that. And, you know, I always tell people, it's so easy to sit back and Monday morning quarterback somebody else's care, right? Like, oh my God, it took you that long to do it? Yeah, it really did. Sometimes it just happens, right? Like, do you remember, like I started IVs on the first time sometimes. Other times it took me two. I mean, it just happens. So the same kind of thing, right? Like we're always evaluating these processes. So what we found is a left large pneumothorax displacing the heart to the left, a significant pneumomediastinum, <clears throat> a small right hemothorax, liver lack, pneumoperitoneum, right clavicle fracture, right ribs two through five fractured, left rib six fractured, a whole bunch of pulmonary contusions, which is the most common pediatric chest injury and trauma, right? Shocking. Uh, a C6 and C7 ligamentous injury, and then compression fractures of T2 through T4. So again, I, I, I don't know that I'd have predicted all of these injuries, but I think just from knowing the car and the missing engine and stuff, I think it's pretty easy to say there's probably a spine fracture thrown in there somewhere or four. Uh, there's probably, you know, really high rate of uh, cervical spine injury in kids that have that much mechanism. So I just always tell people, like, when EMS comes in, don't poo-poo what they're saying. Listen to them. Like, there's really good information that you can get from our, our, our EMS colleagues. Uh, so while in the ED, before we went to the uh, PICU, and this is one of the reasons we had such a long ED stay, was just became harder and harder to ventilate. Her, his sets dropped to the 67%. His hemodynamics were not very stable. There was no ever, no really source of hemorrhage. And that was the confusing thing, right? So there's no like belly full of blood that we're running to the operating room to fix this. There's nothing obvious. And that's the problem initially. So we elected to go to the ICU versus the operating room as if there was no hemorrhage, you know, intraoperative hemorrhage or intraabdominal hemorrhage or chest hemorrhage to control. So we get to the PICU, the SATs were in the 70s, uh, end title was at 33, um, pressures were 80s over 40s, heart rate's 131. The parents came with us, obviously, um, as we try to do. And this is one thing that's a little bit different than when I primarily worked with adults is, you know, we really make an effort to try to keep the parents with the kid all the time. Um, I was talking to somebody, uh, these folks over here last night. And so our transport team is one of the busiest in the country. We have 14 ground ambulances, the Sikorsky S76 C double plus, a King Air and a Learjet, right? We do like 6,000 transports a year. And like, we always try to take a mom or dad with us, whether we're on the helicopter, the fixed wing or the ambulance, just because, how many of you guys have kids? Anybody? Sorry. If it was your kid, you're gonna let them take your kid four hours away without you. And you're just gonna hang out and see what happens until you get there. That's not really work, right? So I always kind of tell people, just think about if it's your child, you know, would you want to go with your kid? And the answer is probably absolutely yes, right? So we try to afford everybody. And I think a lot of people uh, in the peds world do that. We, we just try to keep the parents with them, right? The divorce rate in pediatric trauma, if the kid survives, is still 50%. If the kid dies, the divorce rate goes up to like 80 or 90%, right? Because it's always that you should have watched them closer, you know, whatever. So if you can try to help the family as a whole unit stay together, I think that's just beneficial, right? And this is more health up here than it is health in here, but I still think that's important, right? Look at maybe an all touchy feeling on a Tuesday. Uh, so based on a SAT, there was no bubbling in his chest CT, his massive pneumomediastinum, he wasn't hemodynamically stable. It was, uh, so we decided to open, uh, do a crash laparotomy in the ICU because we were honestly out of ideas of what was going on with this kid. So we're like, well, we, we'll just get his belly and we'll see what we see. So as soon as they opened his belly, his small bowel kind of shot out like one of those cans, like when you top the top and it comes shooting out, very similar, uh, confirming that he did have an abdominal compartment syndrome, which is great. He had very minimal amounts of blood in his belly around the liver, the spleen, pancreas, all of those things appeared fairly air traumatic. His stomach was massive, which was uh, interesting, but not, you know, wholeheartedly shocking. So they dropped an NG in there. And as soon as like they would decompress the stomach, it would immediately just swell back up, which seems odd, right? Like the stomach shouldn't just go, whoo, especially with a kid that's intubated, right? So that seemed a bit weird. So what they did was then uh, try to mobilize um, through his uh, uh, laparotomy at first, try to mobilize his, esoph or his esophagus, but that didn't really work out so well. So we actually ended up doing a thoracotomy on this kid. So it clamshelled him. So now he's got an open belly and his chest has popped like a car hood in the ICU, which, you know, always makes the ICU happy that we're just making a complete and total mess out of the ICU. Uh, so they mobilized his trachea and esophagus and the family had a, had a, a traumatic tracheoesophageal fistula, right? So he had this big communication between his esophagus and his trachea. So every time we were bagging him, it wasn't really, we weren't ventilating very well. And we just kept making his stomach look like a balloon, woo woo, right? <laughs> so we put the ET tube down and tried to push it past uh, that um, 
fistula. Uh, there was a discussion about ECMO. We involved our uh, cardiac surgeons or our heart transplant team, which I mean, just our cardiac surgeons that do all the transplants, they do our ECMO, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it was uh, decided not to put him on ECMO that they didn't think that was probably a viable option at this point. Uh, so obviously the, the right anterolateral thoracotomy, uh, which, you know, we tried to move a little bit. <clears throat> Usually in, tra in trauma, traumatic in injuries, you see a left anterolateral thoracotomy because it gives you access to the, all the great vessels, the heart. In this kid, that we were not looking at that kind of stuff. So we went to the right anterolateral thoracotomy to get to the esophagus. It's a little bit easier coming from the right approach. Um, <clears throat> so when we try to retract him, the kid goes into VFib because like a, your shit day just could not get worse. It can. <laughs> You're winning. Oh, I mean, shoot. Your bad day. My bad. Uh, cannot get worse. It can. It, it absolutely can. Uh, so we extended him to a Ralt or right to left. And so that's a clamshell. Have everybody seen a clamshell, I'm assuming? This is what a clamshell thoracotomy looks like is you just basically cut from here all the way across and then you pop their chest up. It gives you access to everything in the chest, which is really nice. And you can even get up into like zone one neck injuries that way. And his belly's also open. So literally, we can, I mean, we've basically done an autopsy on this kid at this point. Like there's, there's no compartment we haven't opened yet, right? Uh, so we uh, obviously code medications, obviously internal compressions. We get run, return of spontaneous circulation back. Um, and we most wise and clamp his esophagus uh, with a drastic improvement is oxygenation hemodynamics, right? So as long as if we start ventilating the lungs more than his stomach, we're probably going to do it for a better patient. So we cl clamp that and almost, I mean, almost immediate. It's like a, like a diabetic person. When you give them sugar, they like wake up and stop spitting at you. Like you fixed it automatically. I mean, it was that drastic of a change just very quickly. So I always tell people like, you don't have to always do something. When I'm teaching people like new TNCC instructors, I'm like, you don't always have to keep talking. Like silence is okay sometimes. The same thing here, you don't have to keep doing things, right? We're already behind on this kid from a resuscitative standpoint and oxygenation standpoint and, and literally every standpoint there is in this care. So when we clamp that and he starts to improve, just stop doing everything else and continue resuscitating him, right? So just like when we get these kids fresh out of the OR, they're always cold and, or, uh, cold and acidotic, that's just post-operative care, right? We get into the ICU, we wanna warm them up, correct their acidosis, correct their coagulopathy, get them resuscitated, and get them in a better place, right? There's no reason to rush to do anything else. He's improving, let's get some resuscitation on board, some more blood products in this kid, and let's get him up to a little more optimal level before we start you know, going and moving stuff and throwing back into VFIP, right? So that's what we did. We took a little time out. Uh, not, it's not like we went to lunch, but we just you know, stopped doing things. Let's resuscitate, get him back up a little bit. Uh, what we found uh, after that was he had a near complete transection of the esophagus uh, for about five centimeters into the trachea itself. He had a very uh, large complex tracheal laceration extending into the right main stem. So our thought was, you know, push past the fistula, great. Well then <laughs> after further examination, he's got a massive uh, bronchial laceration too. So it's like, man, can we not win for losing here? Uh, but actually went really, uh, did fairly well. He did have several cardiac standstill episodes <laughs> while we were repairing his uh, trachea. Um, you know, you have to repair the trachea. Do you need to repair his esophagus right now? Not unless you're going to feed him cheeseburgers in the next hour, right? So we take his trachea, staple it off, close it. He doesn't need to swallow. We'll be fine. He's intubated right now. You know, it's just less to worry about. He's not going to regurg he, He's not going to aspirate because we've closed his, his esophagus and stapled it shut. But we do need, to re, re, do need to fix his trachea, obviously. So very unstable still. So we decided to close him at this point and leave what, where he was at, right? We fixed his life-threatening injuries. Um, you know, even in, in, in the largest, uh, best centers ever, you're still going to be behind in this kid's resuscitation at this point, right? This just, these are not injuries that you predict. These are injuries that you find in a crash situation kind of thing, right? So we get in there. Uh, do all that stuff. The decision was to close this kid because we were probably had made as much progress as we could. He really needed more resuscitation to warm him up, correct all those bad things that have gone awry, and we'll go from there, right? So <clears throat> as we stated, we really never stopped kind of resuscitating. And during his laparotomy and thoracotomy, he received nearly seven liters of colloids and another 5,300 of, of crystalloid, right? So that's a lot. That's 14, that's seven, eight, nine, ten. It's not 14,000. <laughs> about 12 or 13,000, right? That's still a lot, right? So a lot for this kit um, of product and stuff. So I'm not going to talk about that because we'll get to that later. You have to come to my lecture this afternoon. I apologize. Uh, so are we done yet? The, <laughs> the answer is no. I've yet begun to fight, right? So we continue to have some ventilator, uh, ventilatory difficulties. 
did anybody think like fixing his trachea was going to fix the whole thing and he would be done? No, he had massive contusions. Um, I'm not a fan of oscillators. Uh, I, I think they're good for some things. Um, I'm used to some other ventilatory modes, um, but that's what um, some of our intensivists prefer to use. So that's what they've used. They actually put the kid on there. He did a pretty decent job. Um, but we just kept the kid completely down. Epi drips, norepi drips, neuromuscular blockades, fentanyl drips. You know, we want to keep this kid completely down. We don't want him moving. His chest is literally held together by owl clamps. His belly's open in a massive three liter saline bag. We just don't want this kid knowing what's going on or moving at all, right? Continue to treat his coagulopathy. We did finally realize his blood sugar was 508, but again, as we're in his chest and belly, his blood sugar was not the top of our concern at that point. But again, knowing that critical care management is important, we want to keep some control of his glucose also. So we throw an insulin drip on this kiddo. So you can see the next morning or a few, I say the next morning, this kid came in at night. This was an all night long thing in the ICU. I mean, just, you know, one of those days. And you can see we've kind of got his chest held together with some towel clamps here and nothing really looks like it should. Um, and that's, it's pretty normal, right? So, but here's the nice thing. Look at that. That's not horrible, right? I mean, have we seen better? Yes. But after everything that we've gone through, I'm not mad about this. I think we've done a, we're getting there. His H&H &H is 12 and 39. <clears throat> Oh my God, it's my, it's my time. Okay, I'm like on the last slide or two, I promise. Um, I mean, I'm just saying that. I'm gonna talk as long as I want now. Uh, so uh, glucose 431 is uh, liver enzymes, sh shocking, they're high. Ooh, can you believe that? Uh, his not as coagulopathic, like I don't, that's not horrible, right? I mean, that could be way worse. I would assume those would be five times what all of those numbers were. So I don't think that's horrible, right? We're, we're definitely moving in the right area. So this is just kind of the rest of this kid's care. He was discharged home. He was with us for, <laughs> six, seven months, which is, I mean, again, if you work in kids, that's an extremely long time. Our average length of stay is 3.4 days. This kid was with us seven months. But he was really sick, right? But here's the great thing. He was discharged home on the 22nd. He does have some spast uh, spasticity, quadriplegia, and some dystonia, but it's improving with some of his diabetes and his long-term management because he was a diabetic beforehand. Uh, but that kid actually did really well. Uh, here's my information. Uh, thanks for coming this morning, uh, and, you know, happy Tuesday. And I'll see you guys later this afternoon. Yeah. So take care.